This is a story that we have already been telling in part. But we are really going to start to focus on that we see this a lot in block four. The growing divide between north and south. And then we are going to see it, all of block five is about how that divide led to the Civil War. But we have to get there. How did a united country become divided? And we're going to start to see, I believe that your lecture uh, for over the weekend is about the economic changes going on in the country, that the economy in the north is going to be very different, and it already is different. You know, we've seen from colonial days, Massachusetts and Virginia are different places. Their economy is different, the way class is structured is different, their government is different, and those differences are just going to widen over time. The single biggest difference between North and South is what? Slavery. Slavery. There's, no, there's no revisionistic his history that can get around that fact. That the biggest difference was the fact that slavery was a massive, huge way of life in the South and it wasn't in the North. That there's no escape in that. So let's kind of draw our North and our South. There are two dividing lines. In the original 13 colonies, what's the dividing line between North and South? Mason Dixon line. Above the line, slavery was small and eventually abolished. Below the line, slavery is legal and grows, especially after the cotton gin is invented. What's the next dividing line? When the, after the Revolutionary War between North and South. Missouri River? No. I mean, Missouri River. Missouri River is here. Oh, no, no, the, the um, Ohio. Ohio. The Ohio River. There we go. That if you remember, the Northwest Ordinance abolishes slavery forever and forever above the Ohio River. And so what we see is a country divided in half. Above the Mason-Dixon line and Ohio River, slavery is illegal. Below it, it is legal and growing. And this serves the country perfectly fine until the country grows again. In 1803, the United States bought the territory of Louisiana, and then the question is going to be, okay, what, what's the next dividing line? How are we going to determine where slavery is legal and where slavery is illegal? Now, before we get to that, let's do, we have to go back to government a little bit. And we have to go back to how the Senate works. And we have to do a little counting here. Okay? How many it was in the news last night. How many senators per state? Two. 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 Senator from Wyoming, just as important as a senator from California. Every state gets two. Equality of the states. How do you determine how many House members a state gets? Population. New Jersey has 12. New Jersey has 12. Split evenly, we have six Republicans and six Democrats representing the state of New Jersey. The president gets elected based on what? Electoral oh, votes, which is based on which is based then on which population. Wait, what's it? What's it based on? 
No, 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 the first thing you said. The electoral oh, college. Oh, sorry. And the electoral college is based on population. The more people a state has, the more electoral votes a state has. We've talked about that. So, which institutions are going to be dominated by the part of the country with more people? Which institutions are going to be dominated? The House and the Presidency will be dominated by that section of the country with more people. Okay? Which is, as the country is developing in the 1800s, 1810s, 1820s, is which section of the country? The North or the South? North. The North. The North is growing faster. By the 1830s, we're going to have large-scale immigration again. Birth rates are very high. The North is becoming more populated, which means in the House of Representatives, who is going to have more power? The North. Why? Because they have more people. The West is growing. And when we say the West in this context, we mean the Midwest, the old Northwest, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, etc. That was cute. All right. Let us count. I would like with you to count states in the North in the year 1819. Okay, let's look at our map. Let's count. Let's see how good we are. New Hampshire, one. Vermont, two. New York, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Jersey, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois. Count them. Massachusetts. Let's count states in the South. Virginia is one. West Virginia is not its own state yet. It's part of Virginia. Tennessee. Kentucky. Tennessee. Carolina. Georgia. Who has more House members, North or South? North. 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 Why? Well, 1820 rolls around, and the territory of Missouri applies for statehood. There's a whole process by which a territory becomes a state. Basically what happens is this. When there's less than 5,000 people in the territory, the territory is ruled by Congress. As soon as 5,000 people live in the territory, it can apply for its own territorial legislature, which it gets. When it gets to 30,000 people, it can apply to write kind of a territorial constitution, 
when it gets to 60,000 people, it can apply to be a fully fledged equal state amongst all the others. Okay? In Missouri, Missouri reached 60,000 people in 1819, and Missouri said, hey, Congress, we'd like to become a state now. And then all hell broke loose. All hell broke loose because it has to be, it's very important to determine what in the state of Missouri. Whether, what institution is going to be permitted? Slavery. Will slavery be permitted in the state of Missouri? Will Congress accept Missouri with the institution of slavery? Or will the Missouri Constitution be required to abolish slavery? There are slave owners in Missouri. Not a lot. Some. Most of the people in Missouri do not own slaves. Let's see if we can figure out kind of what the arguments are. What does the North say, do you think? We're not made now in the North. Some people are beginning to be anti-slavery type people, but this is not a major movement yet. Let's just look at our lines and our geography. People in the North say what? Missouri is what? Anti-slave. In the North. In the North. Why? Because it's over. Yeah. What's it called? Right near the you Ohio. See the it's like where the. Yeah, Ohio the is from Mississippi. Over in Ohio, most of it. It's north of the Ohio. Ohio River. Here's the Ohio River. Missouri is north of the Ohio River. We said there's no slavery north of the Ohio River. Therefore, no slavery in Missouri. Duh. South says what? What's their argument? They already have slaves there. They already have slaves there. There are slave owners in Missouri. What does the Fifth Amendment say? Congress can't uh, take away your stuff. Congress can't take away your stuff. Oh, that was right. Yeah, Fifth Amendment. Congress can't take away your stuff, including what? Slaves. Your slaves. Congress cannot take away your property, including your property and slaves. Therefore, Missouri has to be entered into the country as a state where slavery is allowed, permitted. They're really not fighting over slavery. What are they really fighting over? Over the power over the Senate. They're, they're talking about power in the Senate. That if Missouri is a free state where slavery is not permitted, it will be filled up by free settlers working on free farms, not having any cotton plantations and slaves, and Missouri, will Missouri eventually, in that case, kind of join the North? Or will Missouri, in that case, eventually join the South? The North. If slavery is permitted in Missouri and large-scale uh, slavery comes in with giant plantations and slaves because a lot of the land in southern Missouri is excellent for cotton, if Missouri enters the Union with slavery permitted, eventually Missouri will join Southern culture and society. So that's really what they're fighting over here. Congress has to approve new states. When a state, when a territory um, requests admission as a state, Congress has to approve. And a Congress that's divided equally in the Senate is not approving Missouri as a free state. Most of the people in Missouri want it to be a free state, but Congress is not approving that because Southerners in Congress are worried that it will upset the balance. So what are we going to try to do? When you have two sides, find out. Well, how do you, you you're in the halls of Congress. What do we expect to do? Negotiate. Compromise, negotiate, find something that satisfies us. And what comes out of this 
is called the Missouri Compromise. No, they don't split Missouri. There's two. There's three parts to the Missouri Compromise. Okay, we can list them one, two, and three. The first thing is they take the southern border of Missouri. Which is at 36 degrees, 30 minutes north. Okay? 3630 is the line of latitude right there. They say, okay. And this is the territory they're talking about. The United States don't own this yet. Okay? They say north of the line, north of the line, no slavery except for Missouri. Okay, so they draw a line and they say all of the territory north of the line, we won't have slavery there in the future except for Missouri. Missouri will be allowed to have slavery. But all the other territory north of the line, no slavery will be permitted. In what ter we have one territory south of the line. What territory is the Arkansas Territory? Slavery will be permitted in the Arkansas Territory. Okay? In the Missouri Territory, which is the rest of this green, the rest of Missouri, the Louisiana Purchase, no slavery except Missouri. So we draw a nice happy line. Everyone, that's part one of the compromise. Part two of the compromise, because now what's happened to our balance? It is, no, it's not equal. It's, 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 it's now favorite. Missouri. If Missouri is a slave state, it means it's in favor of the South. That if we, so if we did our count again, including Missouri, we now have 12 slave states. How does this one get solved? Maine. They split Maine off from Massachusetts and make it its own state. That's when Maine split off from Massachusetts oh, in 1820. So now in the north, we also have 12. So that's number two, part of the compromise. Part one of the compromise, draw the line, no slavery above it except in Missouri. Slavery is allowed below it. That's one, the line. Number two, to keep the balance in the Senate, Maine comes in as a free state. So far, who does this seem to benefit, north or south? Uh, still the north. It definitely seems to, be to, to benefit the north. Why? Because they have more population. So and what? It's a Look at the map. Look at the map. Look at the map. More area. Yeah, eventually, all of these states are going to be what? Yeah, free states. So something else has to be thrown in there that kind of sweetens the deal for the South. That's the third part of the compromise. The third part of the compromise is free blacks not allowed to move to Missouri. Why? Because it's slave More population. That's it. That if we're telling slaves, you are better off as slaves, you better, and then they see free black people just living free, doing their thing, what are they going to want to do? Exactly. So that's the third part of the compromise. Third part of the compromise, no free blacks are allowed to move to Missouri, which is blatantly unconstitutional. You can't tell, come on in, you can't tell a whole class of people you can't move to this state, uh, but they did. Donna, what's up? Now is not a good time. Um, can you come uh, at the beginning of the So that's the Missouri Compromise, my friends. Three parts. It goes to questions. You know, concerning the growing separation of the North and South. Shh. It goes to questions about compromises before the Civil War. Because eventually, 
We're going to compromise in 1820, we're going to compromise in the 1840s, we're going to compromise in 1850, and then by 1860, we're not going to be able to compromise anymore. So we need to be able to tell that story. Why was compromise impossible by 1860? And in so doing, explain the compromises that kind of led to it. Okay? We're also going to want to try to learn the story. Uh, is the South going to be happy with this long term? No. What's the South going to want to do? Because who owns all this land? Spanish. Uh, after the 18 teens, not Spain anymore, but Mexico. Mexico. This is Mexico. Mexico. Right, we get the secession of that, that Texas, the Texas War of Independence. But let me just preview for a little bit. What are Southerners going to want to do with all of this Mexican land? Conquer it. Why? They, got, they can make slave states down here. What's down here? No, no. Down there. Cuba. A lot of Southerners want to conquer Cuba. Why? What can you, you can make it into slave states. Just conquer all of Mexico. Conquered a third of it. We're going to look at the Mexican War. The Mexican War. The United States first, you know, Texas splits off from Mexico, and then the United States grabs that in a war with Mexico. People, the people who are arguing for this war are which people in the country? Southerners. Opposition to this war is where? In the north. There is a lot of opposition to the Mexican War from anti-slave northern people because they see what's afoot here. They say, look, all this is just going to be a bunch of new slave states. We don't need that land. We don't want that land. That is a, a, a change in continuity type of question could ask you. Discuss the different anti-war movements. The, the movement against the War of 1812, the movement against the Mexican War, the movement against the Civil War, the movement against World War I, the movement against Vietnam. That, that's the type of continuity question that they might ask you. You have to kind of find similarities and differences in those different movements. So there's the Missouri Compromise, which is half of our lecture today about sectionalism. The other half has to do with nullification. Okay. <laughs> Let us Let us go back in time. One of the questions that exists throughout American history is what power, because who here is a citizen of the United States? Many of you, certainly. Take Carmen, for example. <laughs> Carmen is a citizen of the United States of America. She is also a citizen of what? Of the state. She is also a citizen of New Jersey. That fact. That fact harkens back to the fact. One might say that if Keanu was sitting up straight, this would not have happened. Um, guys, this harkens back, this whole 
citizen of New Jersey and a citizen of the United States State Department back to the idea that if you look at the name of our country, it's an adjective and a plural noun. It's a bunch of states that happen to be united. And at this time, until the Civil War, the United States was spoken of as a plural noun. The United States are a big country. That's how people spoke. The United States are growing. Why was it spoken this way? Because it was assumed that the United States was made up of a bunch of individual separate states. That it was not one entity. It was one entity made up with a lot of little ones. And so the question, so when the states got together at the Constitutional Convention, they gave up a lot of their power to the federal government. The power to print money. The power to make war and peace. The power to have tariffs. The power to have packets. That the state, that's what federalism is. The states give up a measure of their power to the group to kind of run things more efficiently. Which begs the question, how much did they give up? How much did they give up? And how much did they retain? That if we look at the Tenth Amendment, it's quite clear. Tenth Amendment says all powers not given to the federal government are hereby reserved to the states and the people. And you could very easily read that to say, if it ain't listed in this Constitution, it's the state's responsibility. So what I want to do is I want to kind of take us a little, a little romp through history and show... That was very much wrong. And show... Romp's a fun word. What is a romp? To romp? To romp is to, like, happily run through, like, a field of flowers, skipping and hopping. That's to romp. Like, a toddler would romp through a ball pit. Oh. Jumping, happy, singing, dancing. We will romp through a list of instances. There is about 18 shades of red. We will romp through a list of instances that brings this question up. What are the powers, rights, abilities of the states against the federal government. And what's the first time it came up? We should know this. Yeah? Try some out. The Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. The Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. Which say, if an unconstitutional law, states protect citizens. This is saying if, if the government passes an unconstitutional law, it's the right of the states to protect its citizens. We don't really get into details about what that means. The next thing that we get is something called the Essex Junta. Which is an anti Jefferson movement. What part of the country do you think? South. Anti Jefferson is going to be in North. the north, in New England. To leave the country, to secede. This was all the whole Aaron Burr thing. Yeah. That it was supposed to be that Burr was going to get elected governor of New York and then combine with New England and oh, break yeah. the country apart. New England was ready to do it, maybe, if they had New York. Burr was going to become the leader of this thing. That's why Hamilton worked against Burr in that election. Because he knew something was afoot. And that's why Burr challenged Hamilton to a duel of guilt. That's the Essex Junta. Then, during the War of 1812, we get something called the Hartford Convention. Which again is in New England. And what they, they're, they don't like Madison's war. This is during the War of 1812. 
They don't like Madison's war against the English. It's really coming down hard on these New England merchants. They're the ones whose ships are being sunk by the British Navy. They're the ones whose trade is being disrupted by all of these different things. So during the War of 1812, a bunch of Federalists gather at Hartford, and they come up with this, with they, they, they do two things. The first is called, they come up with a theory that they call interposition, which is exactly what it sounds like. That a state, if the government, if the federal government is doing something that a state doesn't like, the state may interpose, put itself in between what? The, state the government, the federal government, and oh, it is the state, the, the, state people, the, people. the people that you interpose. Here is the big bad federal government. Here's the little itty bitty person. Interposition says the state can interpose its authority to prevent this. They also, at this meeting in New England during the War of 1812, argue to weaken the central government, the federal government. And they have a whole list of things they want to do. They want to um, make it one presidential term. They want to, uh, war has to be approved by a supermajority of Congress. Um, there's a bunch of proposals that they have. Um, some of the more extreme Federalists at this Hartford Convention are talking about secession, leaving the Union and fighting for the British, on the side of the British against Jefferson's Republicans and Madison and all those people. This is what kills the Federalist Party. But as this is going on, the United States kind of fights to a draw in this war. Everyone's like, who moved the United States? What the hell were you doing during the war, huh? Uh -huh. <laughs> he is disloyal. This destroys the Federalist Party, this hard for convention. But we see that even before nullification, which is what we're talking about for the last 10 minutes, even before nullification, which is coming up now, we have a long history of this question, what are the rights? And in the North and the South, this is not purely a Southern thing. The Virginia-Kentucky resolution is, but the Essex shouldn't do it, the Harvard Convention are up in the North. That this is a question that people are asking. What are the rights of the states vis-a-vis -vis the federal government? And then we get to nullification. Which part of the country likes the tariff? Which part of the country doesn't? Pro-tariff is the north. Anti-tariff is the south. The north likes a tariff because it supports their industry. The south doesn't like a tariff because it hurts an agricultural economy. Pro-tariff, anti-tariff. Andrew Jackson is president of the United States. He's a southerner. He's a Democrat. He negotiates with Congress, and Congress passes a law in, I want to say, 1828? Tariff of Abomination, 1828? 1832. 32. Thank you. I was right before. In 1832, Congress passes and President Jackson signs a new tariff bill. It's a high tariff. It supports the North. Southerners hate it. Southerners hate it so much that they call it the tariff of abominations. It's an abomination. Something that's disgraceful, exactly. Very good. A, the tariff of abominations is a disgrace. And some people in South Carolina starting with the Vice President of the United States of South Carolina, John C. Calhoun. Calhoun says he comes up with this new constitutional theory. And Calhoun says that a state in special convention 
can do what he calls nullify a federal law. What does it mean to nullify something? What's the root of the word? Null. No. No. What does null no mean? Zero. Zero. In, in German, right? No, wait, no. No. Uh, no. no. Latin. Latin, yeah. yeah. No, it's Latin. Latin. That's the last word. What's the German? I don't know. I don't speak German. Pole. Is it your it's not nine. 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 nine is a no, but that's not the rule. Um, so what does it mean to nullify? To make something not less. What is focus? Stopping. Focus. Focus on me. He's like stopping it. It's like calling you a nigger. It's the same thing. What's the what? She's like calling me, calling me a Nazi for knowing German. And you call a German a Nazi, it's like calling an African American. No, no, I said no more slaves. Yeah. That's pretty bad. Shut up. Are we going to have competitions over what ethnic slurs are the worst? I can throw some out at you. No, I'm just saying that that's pretty bad. It's like the same thing. Let's save like comparisons of Nazis to like actual Nazis. Exactly. I hate when people say, "Oh, he's just like a Nazi." Like the Nazis should be, you should leave them to their own Nazi. Okay. Uh, it doesn't do anything to say, "Oh, President such and such is like a Nazi." No, he's or a not. Communist. To nullify means what? Stop. To make zero. To stop to get rid of. So what Calhoun is saying is that an individual state, so we have a law, Tariff of Abominations, the Tariff of 1832. If South Carolina hates the tariff so much, John C. Calhoun says he can call a special convention and vote to nullify that law within the borders of South Carolina. And then that law is nullified, null and void, zeroed out, not followed in the borders of South Carolina. This is a direct result of the Virginia Kentucky resolutions. Yes, it should, the Hartford, it's just the next step in what are the powers of the state against the federal government. Calhoun says it can nullify. Jackson is a southerner, but Jackson is a union man, a nationalist before anything else, and this Jackson says, no way. No way, Jose, can you nullify that the Jackson's a strict constructionist. And the Constitution says that the United States can make tariff laws. And the states can't. And Jackson says, no way. Calhoun, now South Carolina starts going down this very interesting path. South Carolina calls a convention to discuss nullifying the law. South Carolina says the convention meets in 1832. They say on January 1st, 1833, the tariff of abominations is no longer a rule in South Carolina. And they start making militia preparations to defend it. Jackson springs into action. They are calling Jackson's bluff. They don't think Jackson is actually going to do anything. Jackson's a Democrat. South Carolina voted for Jackson. They think Jackson is going to kind of let this slide. Jackson ain't going to let nothing slide. South Carolina says on January 1st, we're nullifying this law. They call out their militia. Jackson says, OK. And Jackson personally says, he says, the next person who talks about nullification, I am going to hang them from the tallest tree I can find. And anyone who knows anything about Jackson probably figured that he was being quite serious. Jackson calls South Carolina to one. Calls out the army. Passes through Congress something called the Force Bill. Force Bill is exactly what it sounds like. Andrew Jackson can use force to put down this nullification in South Carolina. By now, John C. Calhoun realizes his bluff has been called. He is backtracking furiously right now. He resigns as vice president, switches to be a senator from South Carolina, and tries to find a face-saving 
tries to save face in the Senate. And that's, so that's what happens. Jackson offers a carrot and a stick. The stick is the force bill. But kind of behind closed doors, Jackson says, OK, we can negotiate about the tariff. The tariff does come down, not as far as South Carolina wants, but some. The force bill is passed, but never has to be used. South Carolina saves face because the tariff was low. They get rid of their ordinance of nullification. So the crisis passes, but South Carolina learns a lesson. And the lesson that South Carolina learns is if you're going to go again, if you're going to claim states' rights, that's fine. You better have more than one state arguing it. Because when we look at secession 30 years after this, it's not just South Carolina. It's going to be the entire South making this argument. South Carolina is going to spend the next 20 years kind of gathering people to its point of view on this matter. But we see that we are not going to leave this concept of sectionalism for a long time. This weekend, Sunday Question Window. One night's worth of work. Improvement assignments if you need to do it. Enjoy your time on it. Thank you.